Good morning. I'm Joan Urian, an Associate Justice of the Court of Appeal, of the Fourth District. And I'm here with uh, Presiding Justice Judith McConnell, Presiding Judge of the Fourth District Court of Appeal. And we're here today for the Legacy Project for the Appellate Courts. Justice McConnell, you were born and raised in Lincoln, Nebraska, where your dad was a Pulitzer Prize winning newspaper man. When you were very young, your dad wrote a book, Trampled Terraces, which included a chapter all about you, which he entitled The Tomboy. In the book, there's this marvelous illustration of this little girl wearing a cowgirl gun holster. And the chapter starts with a phrase attributed to you, and I quote, put the gun down, Louie. You're not fooling anyone. Did your dad capture your very essence? Well, I have no idea if I actually said that. Uh, the uh, book was about our growing up in Lincoln, and it was called Trampled Terraces because we we lived on a street that had houses with terraces in the front yard and a big median which we played all the time. And I uh, wanted to be a, a cowboy or a cowgirl and uh, loved wearing my holster and my guns. And uh, so yes, I was a tomboy when I was growing up and I, uh, I could outrun any boy and uh, beat him up too if I had to. And, and that all changed in the seventh grade when the boys got stronger. <laughs> and faster. Well, I understand that wasn't just any cowboy holster. It had rhinestones, didn't it? Had it had rhinestones. And I insist, my gr grandfather was a congregational minister in Lincoln, Nebraska. And I insisted on, well, of course, we had to go to church every Sunday. And I insisted on wearing my holster and both of my guns to church. And mom would put on my pretty little church going dress. And then I'd strap on my diamond studded holster. Uh, to go to Sunday school. Sounds like your folks uh, sponsored an independent streak. Well, uh, they had four kids and I was the third of four. And I think it was like herding cats some of the time. And it was just easier to give in, I think. How did you become, if, if you wanted to be a, a, a cowgirl, how did you become interested in law? I got interested in law when I was uh, in college. I was a political science major, and I really wanted to go into government. I had been an exchange student in high school. I went to Japan and lived with the family of a newspaper man in Tokyo, which was very interesting and appropriate. And uh, so, of course, I wanted to go into uh, international affairs and uh, become a United States senator. And I found out that all the United States senators at the time were lawyers. So I said, okay, I'm gonna to have to go to law school. So I went to law school. Well, of course, that's very different from today. They're the yes, exactly. There, there are very few lawyers now in the legislature, and I think it creates a challenge for those of us who are charged with interpreting and applying the law. You said you went to Berkeley in the early to mid-1960s. That was a tumultuous time on the Berkeley campus, wasn't it? Yes. I actually finished my undergraduate uh, degree at Berkeley and went to law school there. And they had the free speech movement, of course, and big demonstrations almost all the time I was there. The free speech movement, of course, shut down the campus. There were uh, anti-war demonstrations. There were civil rights demonstrations. It was a very lively time to be on campus in Berkeley. Um, when you went to Bolt Law School, how many women were in your class? So my uh, first year class at Berkeley had oh, over 200 uh, students, maybe 225 students. And at the very beginning, I think there were 16 of us. And the reason there were so many was they started drafting men uh, be up until that time, men were deferred uh, if they were going to graduate school or law school, but the uh, military started drafting men, and so that uh, gave more opportunities for women in law school. Now, you said you were 16 when you started. Were there 16 when you graduated? No. No, some dropped out. Some may have transferred. I don't know what happened to them all. Okay. When you were in law school, 
What was it like being a woman law student? Well, it was a challenge. I remember the first day of law school uh, at Bolt, which is what it was called at the time, uh, one, one of the young men sitting in front of me, and we were all seated in alphabetical order, A to Z in the first semester, and then they reversed the alphabet for the second semester, and we all took the same classes. And one uh, young man turned to me and said, what are you doing here, taking up the space a boy could take? How did you respond to that? I said, I'm going to be a lawyer. Um, so that was the end of that conversation. <laughs> Were you interested in being a litigator when you were in law school? You know, I hadn't really thought about what I wanted to do when I was in law school. I, it's, it's hard being a law student. The first year was a big challenge, learning how to think like a lawyer. And, uh, and it wasn't really until probably, well, it wasn't really until I was looking for a job that I thought about what kind of lawyer I wanted to be. And then what I wanted to be was whoever would hire me, <laughs> that's what I was going to be. Well, did you ever think you'd have trouble finding a job as a lawyer? No, no, you know, it never occurred to me that I would have trouble finding a job as a lawyer. All my life I'd been a good student, I worked hard and moved along, and when I started looking for work, and I looked in San Diego, because that's where my husband uh, got a job as a professor, uh, the private law firms wrote me, many of them, and said, we're going to stick with the boys. And some of them did interview me, but uh, the only job I could get was working for government because government uh, was more open to women and minorities in those days. Some of them were under consent degree, decrees because of the Civil Rights Act. So to get a job as a lawyer in the public sector at that time, did you have to go through a state personnel board interview? Yes, I actually, um, I got a job working for the uh, Caltrans legal division. Uh, they handled all the litigation for Caltrans in District 14, which was San Diego and Riverside, and I, oh, of course Imperial. And um, the head of the office, offered me the job and I took it and started working there. But in order to keep the job and to be permanently hired, I had to be interviewed by the state personnel board. So I went up to Los Angeles uh, to the state building downtown and uh, the interview was by four white men. And during the interview, one of the men turned to me and said, well, how are you going to choose between being a lawyer and being a, uh, uh, a wife. And I said, well, when you were interviewed, were you asked how you would choose between being a lawyer and a husband? And he said, no, I wasn't. I said, then I refuse to answer the question on the ground it's discriminatory. And he turned brick red all the way to the top of his head. And uh, I got the highest score in the state. So you traded your cowboy gun or cowgirl gun holster for many skirts. Oh yes, we were all wore mini skirts in those days. And you were trying jury cases for yes. Caltrans. How many women did you see in the courtrooms in San Diego and Imperial County at that time? Well, I, I was a civil practitioner. I practiced here in Imperial and in Riverside. Uh, and I never saw uh, a woman judge. I never appeared in front of a woman judge. I know there was a woman judge in San Diego before early on in the municipal court. Um, I did have one trial against a woman lawyer who wore a, her big Phi Beta Kappa key to trial every day. It's a big, big one. Did you wear yours? So I put on mine. I still can't, to this day, I can't find it, but I put, mine wasn't so big. But uh, I did win the case. How did juries react to you as a, as a woman in the courtroom at that time? The juries were fabulous. I have to say that one of, I, I tried my first jury trial alone three weeks after I was sworn in as a lawyer in Indio. And uh, it was an eminent domain case involving some property out on, on the border. And um, the jurors, I won the case. Uh, I mean, I was so nervous that when I stood up, I had to lean against the table because my legs were like noodles. I was very nervous, but I won the trial. And afterwards, three of the jurors came up to me to talk to me about how I'd done. 
And uh, they said, every time you raise up a map or a chart to put on the bulletin board, we could see what color your underwear <laughs> was. So I started wearing two-piece outfits after that. <laughs> they changed the way I dressed for trial. But they were wonderful. I remember once trying a case with Patricia Cowett, who out in Indio, a uh, personal injury case. And afterwards, uh, one of the jurors came up to her and said, I just want to take you home in my purse. You're so cute. And introduce you to my husband, uh, my, excuse me, my son. And uh, so, so we, the jurors were very good to us. You said you never appeared in front of a woman judge. What made you think that one day you might want to be a judge? Well, first of all, I appeared in the superior court only. I never appeared in the municipal court. Uh, I thought our bench was very good at the time, and it looked like an interesting job to me. And Governor Jerry Brown was the governor in those days. That was his first go-round. And he was appointing women to the bench, unlike many prior governors. And uh, women and um, people of color were getting jobs as judges, and I thought, I'd like to do that. And it looked like a fun job, and it actually is. So I put my name in. Somebody told me, actually, that <clears throat> because I worked for the state, I was not likely to get an appointment that I should go into practice of doing something else. So I went into uh, sole, as a sole practitioner, but working as, in association with two other women. And I got a lot of uh, ca interesting and some horrible cases, but mostly I was doing trial work for public agencies contract trial work. You know, when you were with Caltrans, you just had a, a young child. That's and, right, Anthony. And today, young women attorneys, and indeed, really all young attorneys, struggle with work-life balance issues. When, when Anthony was born, you were a full-time litigator for Caltrans. How did you do it? Well, first of all, I don't think there is such a thing as balance. I think it's more like juggling. And <clears throat> when Anthony was new, new baby, I took him to work. I had him set up in my office and because I'm not in court all the time. And uh, so until he was, I think when he started eating solid foods and making such an awful mess, I, I found someone to take care of him while I was at work, but I took him to work with me when I could. Obviously, when I was in trial, I couldn't, I couldn't take him to the office, but uh, it's a big challenge for uh, uh, parents to handle child rearing, and, um, and I know you make sacrifices, you know. Sometimes your trial takes 18 hours a day, and you have to tend to your children, but you have to have to dedicate yourself to your work when, you, when you're in trial. You know, people talk about the importance of a mentor, somebody to teach you how to practice law, how to try jury cases. You were in the courts very shortly after you were hired. Who taught you how to try a case? Well, I worked at Caltrans. It was a small law office. I think there were only five or six lawyers, and they were all in trial all the time. And the head of the office was Dick Rapinski, who was uh, a very liberal progressive. He hired me, I think, because he thought it was cool to hire a woman. And he had me sitting in second chair even before I had passed the bar, even before I was sworn in as a lawyer. I was at least sitting at council table. And he had sent me actually to different courts, including up to LA, to watch good lawyers. He said the best lawyer for cross-examination is Lou Welsh. So, so he sent me to watch Lou Welsh cross-examine an expert witness. Lou Welsh later became a very distinguished judge here. He said the best lawyer for handling opening statement is somebody in LA. So I went up to LA to watch opening statement. And of course, Rapinski himself was a great lawyer and I watched him as well. So they really trained me to from day one to be a lawyer and helped me do that and critiqued me when it was over. There's a wonderful story, and perhaps you can tell me whether it's true, that one day you went in to the office and you were complaining that you were bored. 
and that that indirectly, this is to your mentor, uh, that indirectly may have been responsible for you getting involved in community activities. Is it a true story? What happened? No, that is a true story. Y you know, the way our, our work went, in those days there wasn't a lot of discovery or depositions. You were in trial or you were preparing for trial. And then between trials, there wasn't, it was slow. It was, and I liked, you know, action. So I told uh, Rapinski that I was bored and he slammed his hand down on the desk and said, there's no excuse for boredom. Go out in the community and do something. So I, uh, he was very active uh, in the Sierra Club, even though he worked for Caltrans. It sounds kind of odd, but he was, uh, I think, chair of the Sierra Club. He was mayor of Del Mar. And so I uh, became, I joined NOW. I started going to their meetings. I became a spokesperson for NOW, a National Organization for Women. And I uh, spoke up about the Equal Rights Amendment, which was pending at the time. And why, why did you choose uh, to get involved in issues of gender discrimination? Well, I, I'd had a rough time getting a job, as, as I think I mentioned. It was very hard uh, for women, and uh, I remember you know, some public agencies, even though they were under a court order, were reluctant to hire women. Or if they hired women, they put them in the back office. They didn't want anyone to know that they'd hired a woman. So. Uh, th there was rampant discrimination. There was also a lot of discrimination against women in the law. Uh, women, for example, who were married had no right to manage and control community property. You couldn't get a credit card in your own name without your father. You could get your father or your husband had to sign to get a credit card. You couldn't ha have a stock uh, uh, account at a brokerage. I mean, it's just sort of on and on and on. When was this? This was in the uh, 70s. I mean, and, and so we started working to change all that. And in fact, it was around that time, I think 1972, that a group of us uh, founded Lawyers Club of San Diego, which was the feminist, is still a very active feminist bar association in San Diego. There couldn't have been very many women lawyers. There uh, were not. There were not. There were about, we surveyed all of them. There were 24 of them women lawyers in town. And, uh, and 19, of, I had the forms, and I recently turned them over to the Lawyers Club for their archives. The, 19 of the 24 voted to form a formal organization. They had been having lunch every now and then, women lawyers. Uh, and uh, so we voted to form Lawyers Club, and uh, one of our goals was to improve the status of women in the law and women in the legal profession, and they're still working on that. You know, those of us who are of a certain age recall not being able to go to the local eating establishments or the local clubs where a lot of business was done. And that was true here in San Diego at the Grant Grill. But you and Len Schenk, who I think you've described as your mentor, had what I'd call a lunch in at the Grant Grill. Can you tell us about that? Yes, that's quite famous. Actually, uh, Lynn Shank and I became friends uh, early on. Uh, she was working for the AG. We were both in the state building. She was on one floor, I was on the other. And a friend, uh, a colleague introduced us and we clicked immediately. Uh, she went on to become a member of Congress, and she's very active in, in uh, government. She was chief of staff for Gray Davis. Anyway, we've been close friends ever since. And there was a, uh, the Grant Hotel right downtown had a, a very nice eating establishment called the Grant Grill. And all the lawyers would go there for lunch. And uh, they wouldn't let us in. They wouldn't let women in. They had a sign that said, no women allowed before 3 p.m. So uh, Lynn and I and Elaine Alexander, who now heads Appellate Defenders, uh, uh, went over there and we had had somebody call to make a reservation. I don't think they used our name uh, or maybe they, they used initials. And so we got, go up to the entryway and the maitre d' said, I'm sorry, you can't come in, pointed to the sign. And we said, well, that's, uh, y you have to let us in, we have a reservation. 
And he actually was, I was holding onto the door jam and he was pushing me physically out the door. And one of us had a copy of some district court opinion from uh, New York State that said you've got to, uh, you, you know, public facilities can't discriminate against women and people of color. Uh, so we, we waved this opinion around, which probably had no effect at all on uh, where we were. And they let us in, they put us in the back in an area where, uh, near the kitchen door, I think, and people came up to us while we were sitting there having, and they served us lunch, they were, while we were sitting, and cursed at us. Of course, men, these were men, <laughs> the place was full of men. Uh, and we kept going back until we got them to take down the sign. Now they have a plaque honoring us outside the entrance to the grill. But that wasn't the only place. I mean, there were clubs. Uh, the Cuyamaca Club didn't allow women in. Uh, the, there was a boat out on the harbor called the Reuben E. Lee, and uh, it was on public property, leased from the port. And they had a, a men-only place as well. And I took my colleagues from Caltrans over there, and they let us in. And I said, if you don't change this practice, you know, I'm going to report you to the Port Authority. <laughs> and uh, they did. They changed their practice because government entity isn't allowed to discriminate based on gender or se uh, race. Well, what did it matter whether you could go to the Grant Grill or the Reuben Lee? Why did it make any difference? It mattered that we were shut out of places, that we were excluded. That there, you know, our world, the legal world, was a uh, boys' club, and uh, and it 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 was an important uh, uh, gap in our ability to network with other professionals, and um, makes you feel like a, a second or third class citizen when you can't uh, go to certain places. You were appointed in 1977 mere seven years after you got out of law school, at your, and you were at age 33, to the municipal court. And then two years later, you were elevated to the superior court, where you would serve for some 20 years. And then in 2001, you were appointed to the Court of Appeal, where you currently sit and are the presiding justice. And each of these positions, you served in a management role. Judges are kind of an independent lot, and it must, be, must have been difficult to try and manage cases and judges, and to do have done it so very well. How'd you do it? Well, I was always interested in administration. Uh, because I figured out in early on when I became a municipal court judge uh, that uh, the best way to change things was to work within the system. As somebody said to me, one of the other, it's okay to rock the boat, but don't rock it so hard you fall out. So I got on the personnel committee of the municipal court, and that was a very good way to affect their hiring policies. And they were, you know, very, Establishments like that were not very favorable to women professionals, and we started working on changing that. And I then I was uh, elevated shortly after that to the Superior Court. I went on the Personnel Committee right away on the Superior Court, and I also ran for the Executive Committee, which was an elected position. So my first year on the Superior Court, I was elected to the uh, Executive Committee, which was kind of a shock to everybody. Uh, so. Uh, I got engaged in court administration very early on because I felt that was the way to change the culture of the court, change hiring policies. I remember once we were interviewing a secretary, judicial secretary, the judges did all the hiring in those days. Now it's done by court executives. And we were interviewing a secretary and one of the judges asked the candidate how what kind of birth control she was taking or wasn't she planning on having children. I kicked him under the table and <laughs> during the interview. And after she left, I said, that is an illegal question. You can't ask that question of any of these candidates. And so that's how you start changing an organization. You educate your colleagues about what's right and what's wrong, what's a better practice, what's not. And I gradually moved up into 
I was a kind of supervising judge of almost every department, family court, juvenile court, uh, civil on motion on the Superior Court. I did civil law in motion for quite a long time. And that was a fabulous assignment. Hard, hard work, but a very interesting assignment. Why was it so hard? Well, because the volume of motions every day. There were two courts hearing all of the civil pretrial motions. And uh, one in the morning, had we had a full calendar. And one in the afternoon, the other judge had a full calendar. And we had uh, heavy motions, lots of summary judgment motions, demurs. There were occasionally light things like change of name petitions, uh, but mostly uh, it was uh, day in and day out. You had to take work home, and they had research attorneys working for us. But I felt I had to read everything myself as well, and uh, uh, so I did. I took work home with me every night and made sure I could read everything before I took the bench. You were the first woman uh, who was elected by your colleagues to be the presiding judge of the Superior Court, which was the first time in California history that a major metropolitan uh, court had had a woman as its presiding judge. Well, How was that received? I had been uh, presiding judge of the juvenile court. Uh, I was sent out there to stabilize things. Things had been kind of shaken up by my predecessor. And um, they, I thought, after some time in juvenile court, that I could do more for juvenile court if I became PJ of the whole court. And so uh, when I was uh, PJ of juvenile court, I ran for uh, assistant presiding judge. It was a very tricky election because there were three candidates and uh, two of us tied. Oh no, that's not how it worked. With three candidates, then there was a runoff between the two. In the runoff, we tied, and uh, and so we had another election, and I won. Uh, and so then I was PJ. For, then nobody ran against me again for assistant PJ second term or for PJ. No one ran against me, and. Uh, my uh, main program change, aside from putting the best judges I knew of in juvenile court, was to change the way civil cases were handled. So I started the uh, independent or direct calendar system at uh, Superior Court to improve the way civil cases were handled, because we had a delay reduction program that we, people really hated. And uh, uh, it was working slowly but surely, but people really hated uh, the way de delay reduction was implemented. Why was that? Can you? It was brutal. Uh, my predecessor in the court was kind of rough on people, and uh, rules were changing all the time. You could go to the clerk's office, even the clerks didn't know what the rules of court were. So one of my promises was that we weren't going to have any rule changes without them being publicized and that they would only change, would not change more than once a year. Uh, that sounds like an odd agenda to have as a PJ, but it was chaos before that. And so uh, I, I changed the way civil cases were handled by setting up a direct calendar. I picked nine judges to do it, and we took all the old cases, which were some of which were approaching five years, and I divided them up. I had a training program for all the judges. I had separate training programs for the staff because the staff had to, their clerks had to do calendaring, calendar management. And uh, it's been a very successful program. It's, it's not as successful now as it was then because the caseload is too high. They cut back the number of judges hearing and they cut back uh, hearing a direct calendar and they cut back the staff support uh, because of the budget crisis. So it's a very hard assignment. It always was a hard assignment, but super interesting. And after I left, uh, PJ. By the way, I also uh, thought trial management was important, and so we had a managing trials program that I mandated for all the judges. We closed down half the courts. Every judge, whether you were handling trials or calendars or whatever, had to attend, and then the other half had to go. And and that I think helped shorten our trials dramatically. How was that received by the judges? Oh, some of them were furious with me uh, for having them take time away from their courts to learn new skills on how to handle uh, their calendars. But it, part of what my thinking was that one judge alone couldn't change the way the court did business. You had to get everybody to buy in 
to the changes because of the peremptory challenges. If one judge is doing things in a more efficient fashion, they'll get challenged all the time because the judges, the lawyers like to run the case uh, and they don't like having the judge run the case. What do you, what do you think made the difference in your managing the judges at that time? You, you instituted a lot of change. Was it the fact that you were a woman? Was it your education? What was it that you obviously were successful? Well, you were twice I, elected. I always had an attitude that it, you get more done by working with people than by trying to order them around. And it was very difficult. You couldn't order the judges around anyway. And so my style was to be inclu inclusive in the decision making process. Uh, but uh, you know, if there was something I wanted done, you know, we worked to get that done. And uh, I, I felt that we had a very collegial court. There were some who weren't happy. Um, we had, uh, we were the first court in the, uh, in the state to adopt uh, sunshine in the courts so that settlements of civil cases would not be secret unless there was good cause shown files would not be kept secret unless good cause was shown. That's now state rule, but secret settlements were kind of the norm uh, before we adopted our rule. So we, we made a lot of changes that I think were very good changes. You've mentioned a couple of times that you have a love for the juvenile court system and, and you loved your time in the juvenile court. Why was that? Well, it, it, people who are in juvenile court, judges who serve in juvenile court, really can make a difference in a person's life. The juvenile's life, their family's lives, and th you don't feel that way so often in a criminal court. Now I know the drug court judges feel that they can make a difference, and I'm very happy to hear that because with adults so much of the time in criminal cases, all they want to know is how many years they're going to serve. In juvenile court, you really did get children committing crimes. I mean, and they weren't so hardened. No. So the feeling was, including with uh, dependency cases, that you could do something to help these people and see good results. And it, I have to say, the first week I was in juvenile court, I know this isn't going to sound very judicial, I cried all the time because the cases were so awful. Uh, I, I really had no idea people did such horrible things to their own children, or to any children, and those were the dependency cases. And um, so it was a hard assignment, and my kids were little at the time, and I felt like I was carrying a social worker on my shoulder all the time as a parent, because you second guess your own decisions uh, as a parent when you serve in juvenile court. Uh, it's a very hard assignment. The calendars are very heavy, uh, but it's very rewarding. And on Fridays, we had an adoption calendar. And the adoption calendar made you feel so good, especially on kids who were considered not adoptable. Uh, and I remember one kid who was considered not adoptable, and he had been placed with a foster mother who just adored him and took such good care of him, and she adopted him. There wasn't a dry eye in the court when that adoption went through. It was very moving. And that was a nice way to end the week, to do the adoptions. You know, sometimes you have to make really tough calls. And you had to make a really tough call in a pretty prominent case in juvenile court, the Beatty case. Can you tell us about that? Well, the Beatty case uh, originally came to me when I was downtown. I wasn't in juvenile court. It was, I had a, a period of time when I was just a trial judge doing general trials, and the PJ sent the case to me for a trial on a contempt case. And the family was uh, just ripped apart. The mother was a Pentecostal, very religious uh, person, and the father, uh, uh, the, they were divorced, obviously. The father had uh, come out as gay, and the mother decided uh, she was not going to uh, 
have the boy have anything to do with the father. A prior judge had tried to get visitation implemented uh, and couldn't, so uh, the prior judge changed custody and gave custody to the father. On the mother's first visitation, she absconded with the boy and went into hiding for a couple of years, and she was finally found with her son in Colorado, and the two of them were brought back to uh, San Diego. So I was assigned the trial of the contempt case, uh, and so that was a, a quasi-criminal proceeding, and I was assigned the an OSC Ray change of custody, uh, and there was another case that was sort of trailing that uh, had juvenile court uh, ties. And so uh, I tried them. It was a nasty, hard-fought case. Uh, and I found the mother in contempt, two counts of contempt. I gave her credit for time served. The father wasn't happy with that because he wanted her locked up forever. And then I uh, had to figure out what to do with the boy. During the pending proceedings, he had been in a foster home. And um, so my custody order in the end was to put him in a different foster home and allow uh, mother and father visitation. But father uh, got to visit first and mother only got as much visitation as the father got. I wanted her to support the father's visits. And that actually worked out really well. And after a period of time, uh, the boy decided he, he was by then 13 or 14 years old, he wanted to live with his father. And so he moved in with his father and his father's partner. Well, I thought that was a happy ending, and it was. The boy was very happy. He was in school, he had a girlfriend. The dad died of AIDS. Uh, the boy petitioned the court to have his father's partner appointed as guardian so that he could finish his school, and he had a job too. So that was, uh, interestingly enough, the mother defaulted when it was set for trial in my court, and the mother failed to, didn't appear, didn't file any opposition, attacked me royally in the press, and uh, uh, so I gave aborted custody, made him, appointed him guardian, guardian. Boy was 17 at the time. So he was guardian until the boy turned 18. And by the way, the boy has turned out very nicely, as I understand it. I heard reports uh, later on that he uh, got married and had some kids. He became a police officer in the Midwest. Uh, but I was vilified by uh, the mother and her supporters, and I received death threats. And uh, in fact, when I got, I had a drawer full of death threats. I, I, uh, I got on all sorts of really ugly mailing lists. And, and I think that uh, case uh, was a big factor in, when I was nominated for the district court, I think that was a big factor in the failure of my uh, appointment to go through. Justice Robert Thompson, the California Court of Appeal, um, wrote an article, he was in Los Angeles, he wrote an article in the legal press uh, calling your decision courageous. And he said that lesser judges would have ducked that case, as judges did in his day. And the fact that you took the case and, and used your keen intellect and a liberal dose of street smarts to come to a very good ending marked your, your career. And he said that it was defies, it defied good sense that that decision derailed your appointment to the federal court. Can you tell us what happened? Well, giving custody of a boy to a gay man was very controversial. And the father was gay, he was living with a very fine man. And, um, in those days, uh, there, it was considered taboo to be gay, still in those days. Not that long ago. When was that? That was back in the 80s. And, um, and when I came up for a federal court nomination, uh, it was still considered 
taboo. This was 1994, wasn't it? Correct, 1994. And, um, but I've always felt that it, you can't be a good judge if you're always looking over your shoulder at what uh, the what people are going to say. You have to make your decision based on the evidence and the law. And if you can't do that, you don't be all, belong on the bench. And uh, and I, I felt that very strongly in all kinds of cases, that if I couldn't face the public with my decision, then I shouldn't be making those decisions. Somebody else should be doing it because uh, it, it's, that's what judges have to do. You have to make tough calls sometimes. And, uh, and I still feel that very strongly, I think. And as it turns out, here I am at the Court of Appeal. What a perfect job I have. Uh, I'm very lucky uh, uh, to have this job. And so in the end, it worked out well for me uh, uh, because here I am, love this job. Over the course of your career as a judge, you've handled a lot of cases. Um, People go to the ballpark, and and uh, although you didn't put the ballpark there, your decision as a secret judge is responsible in some measure for the fact that that ballpark is sitting in San Diego today. Well, I had, uh, they, they started working on the ballpark without following the CEQA. And so I had a, uh, Actually, an organization filed a lawsuit to enjoin the city from doing infrastructure work to prepare for construction of the ballpark. And I enjoined it. And boy, did I get roasted on the sport by the sportscasters. I enjoined construction. And <clears throat> the Western Metals building, which everyone loves, it's in the outfield of Petco Park, is there because the parties settled it. The city, they didn't appeal my decision. The city uh, entered into agreement to preserve historic buildings, one of which is now part of the ballpark, and, um, and also to preserve other historic buildings in the neighborhood. So there, it's just a wonderful feel when you go down to the ballpark. The old warehouses are now commercial ventures or office spaces or part of the ballpark. And, and that really was uh, uh, because of the uh, uh, CEQA hearing that I had and the party's uh, negotiations with resolved successfully. You know, one of the things people don't understand is a lot of cases that are tried in the Superior Court are not appealed. They are successfully resolved. And I can think of dozens of cases that I had that were not appealed. I have one in mind where I was hung in effigy, uh, but uh, it turned out that it was resolved, was not appealed, and uh, uh, resolved successfully. So, you know, there are lots of times when you make a decision that people live with and uh, move on. I'd like to bring you back to when you were first appointed in the bench, um, the late 1970s, early 1980s. There weren't a lot of women. Uh, on the bench at that time, were there? No. Uh, when I became a municipal court judge, uh, Artie Henderson had been appointed by Reagan to the Superior Court, and at some point Brown appointed uh, Elizabeth Zumwalt to the Superior Court. So I was the third woman on the Superior Court. On the municipal court, Judy Keep, who later became the first female district court judge, was already there, as was Janet Kinner. In fact, Judy Keep was designated my mentor judge when I became a muni court judge, what, which was wonderful for me because Judy was an old friend. And I had never even appeared in municipal court, much less handled criminal cases. So I could ask her any dumb question I wanted and she would willingly answer. And when I had my first trial, which was a traffic ticket, uh, she sat with me on the bench and we heard the testimony and uh, and then she turned to me and said, okay, you decide. You know, you have to decide guilty or not guilty at the end of the traffic ticket. And, you know, that's not an easy job to do, but you have to do it. That's what you get paid to do. And, uh, and so I was very lucky uh, when I went on the municipal court that I wasn't the first woman 
that I had Judy keep uh, to help me through that transition. Did it really make any difference whether there were women judges or, or uh, uh, individuals of color on the bench? And if so, why? I feel very strongly that it makes a difference to have uh, diversity on the bench, women and uh, people of color. It affects the way the community perceives the court. I think it affects the decision-making process. I think it's uh, women uh, judges who have been instrumental in changing many of the laws that we work with. Uh, now. Uh, in the olden days, the bad old days, uh, in a rape trial, a jury was instructed uh, to view a victim's uh, a testimony with doubt. You know, that it's, you know, not worthy of belief, not necessarily worthy of belief. And th that was just, you know, so rape cases, they, they were often not prosecuted at all because it's one person's word against the other. And they didn't have DNA testing in those days, which has been very helpful. Uh, it, it was hard. Women had a tough time as witnesses, as victims. They had a tough time as lawyers coming into a courtroom. Putting women on the bench in family court, I think, made a big difference because women felt they could get a fair shake. Uh, early on, uh, if you went into family court to get a child support order, the orders were very low. So one of the things we worked on was getting uh, guidelines set. Some states already had adopted child support guidelines, and California was a little slow in doing it, but I remember testifying up in Sacramento before a legislative body uh, that California should adopt child support guidelines. They were adopted. Uh, the Judicial Council did adopt them. The legislature required that they be adopted. And it has made a huge difference uh, uh, for uh, families. And in those days, the judges often thought, and I'm talking men judges, the guy can't afford it. He'll lose his job if he has to pay child support. It's not fair to the guy. It'll be too hard on him. But they never thought about how hard it was on the women and children who were trying to subsist on very small amounts of money. And I think that women judges made a difference there. Uh, the educational programs for judges, we started uh, educational programs to teach people about uh, sex discrimination and how it makes a difference in decision making. And the judges were kind of resentful at first. They sat there with their arms across their chest. Uh, but the first course on, uh, for judges on sex discrimination in the law, the uh, judicial decision making, it does sex make a difference, was taught. We brought it to, actually, the National Association of Women Judges brought it to seizure, and uh, it was a very successful program. The teachers were, we picked teachers that we knew would help, that, we, that had a good style. Uh, Marilyn Patel was a muni court judge in Oakland. And Mike Bellacci, I think, I can't remember if he was Muni or Superior Court. The two of them taught the course with Professor Norma Wickler from UC Santa Cruz. And it, I don't know if you could call it a success, but it worked. It was replicated several times. It was copied by the National Judicial College. And, um, and teaching judges how to avoid bias is the norm now, not the exception. You felt strongly that women made a difference and could make a difference in, in California courts. And there's a wonderful story about you being at a cocktail party where the governor, I presume Jerry Brown at the time, was attending. And he said, well, Judge McConnell, I'd appoint women if I could only find qualified women. And that you raced across the, the, uh, the ballroom, grabbed Patricia Cowett, said to her, come, you've got to meet the governor, told her she had to put her application in, that you would sponsor her and mentor her if she was appointed. Well, she was appointed, and you did mentor her. And her story is you're not unique. Did you do that as a routine practice? I always have tried to encourage people that I thought uh, would contribute to diversity on the bench. 
I encourage them to apply and to and then to help them be very good judges if I could do that. Uh, the other thing I I mean it's hard learning to be a judge. It's a, it's a different job altogether. It looks easy from the outside, but it's a tough job. And uh, and so you want people that can that can handle that tough job, but you want diversity on the bench. It's important for the public to see that they will have a fair shake if they go into the courtroom and if they see people that are that look like them. I think they'll feel better about going into the courtroom. And so I've always tried to encourage uh, young uh, women and people of color to apply for the bench. And, and we've seen some pretty significant changes in San Diego since um, the bad old days. Describe those changes. Well, uh, now we have uh, the third woman who's on track to be a uh, presiding judge of the San Diego Superior Court. That's taken a long time. Uh, we're still having trouble getting people into the highest uh, management positions of the courts, uh, although uh, LA also had a woman finally become a PJ. Uh, it's, uh, it's a slow, hard process, but about a third of the judges now are women, which is a big change from, uh, from the olden days. Uh, there's still not enough uh, Hispanics on the bench. California has a very large Hispanic population and, uh, and uh, we need to do more to increase the numbers of Hispanics on the bench. Throughout your judicial career, you've worked pretty consistently to make systemic improvements to California's judicial system. You twice served on the California Judicial Council, which is the policy-making body for the state. You served as a member of the Blue Ribbon Task Force on Jury System Improvement. You served on the Commission on the Future of the Courts and the Advisory Commission uh, on Gender Bias in the Courts and the Commission on Impartial Courts. Other than the fact that you don't sleep, <laughs> why'd you do it all? Well, I, I, I like tinkering with things to try to make them better. And, uh, you know, why are we here if not to do the job and do it better if we can if if we can see an opportunity to make it better and i first of all the gender bias uh task force uh didn't start in california the gender bias uh task force started in new jersey uh, by a judge who approached her chief judge justice and said we need to do something about bias in the courts so they did a, the first gender bias study in new jersey and when they came out with their report, I uh, took it, sent it to Rose Bird and said, we need to do something like this in... Rose Bird was our chief justice. Our chief it's justice. And then uh, I, I, I didn't hear from her. And then uh, uh, New York did a gender bias task force and came out with a report. And I got the report and I sent it to Rose Bird. And I said, this is a great report. We need to do something about this. And I didn't hear from her. Uh, and then just before she uh, left office, like I literally a day or two before the end of her term as chief, after she had failed to get uh, win the retention election, she established a gender bias task force and she didn't put me on it, even though I was president at the time of the National Association of Women Judges. Uh, Malcolm Lucas, to his credit, picked up the gender bias fully task force, fully supported it, appointed me to it, uh, and, uh, and supported implementation of the report's recommendations. So that was very important work to me and, uh, and I think made a big difference. And I think you can make lots of improvements in the system. And if you want to make them statewide, you need to participate in those kinds of uh, commissions and committees. Why did we? Why did we need a gender uh, uh, bias task force in California if there had been one in New Jersey and one in New York? Exactly. Why did you have to do it again? That in is the question. Why do you, did every state have to do it? Because the judges in California said, "Well, that's New Jersey. We're not anywhere like New Jersey." Or that's New York. We're not anywhere like uh, New York. 
or in, in every state had to go through this same process saying we're different. And the fact of the matter is every state had a problem and they had to address it. Individ each state had to address it on their own. They had to persuade their judiciary that there was a problem that needed to be addressed. And that's what the task forces did. And I think in the end there were over 30 states that had gender bias task forces. I think California was the third. Uh, and uh, of course the changes were I impressive that we uh, uh, implemented. Uh, but I also served on the uh, Commission on the Future of the Courts, and part of that was envisioning a good outcome future. Uh, what's the worst possible thing that can happen? What's the best possible thing that can happen? And if you want the best outcome, what can we do to do that? And uh, one of the things that uh, we recommended, I chaired the civil uh, uh, law committee of the Future of the Courts Commission was we, we pushed for state funding of the courts. In those days, uh, the courts were funded by uh, the counties, and some courts had very, very little funding. If you, you could not get uh, a courtroom built in some of these counties, they had literally trailers as their only courtroom. And state funding uh, brought many counties up so that they could have adequate justice systems in their in their counties. Uh, it, it, it brought some of the uh, poorer counties up. Uh, the richer counties were already doing very well, so they didn't, they weren't brought down, but uh, uh, state funding has been very important. In the, in when, when I was PJ, we didn't have, we had block grants, so each judge, we would get a block grant for each judge in addition to the county funding that we had. And it was a pretty lousy system. So I've been happy to see state funding. How has that improved the quality of justice statewide? Well, for one thing, the, uh, the local uh, politicians are not in charge of the budget for the courts. It's the state uh, judicial council. The legislature allocates the money. And the judicial council, the legislature budgets the money with the governor and then the Judicial Council allocates it, and they uh, are working on allocating it fairly uh, among the courts based on workload, and that's a big change, uh, that the court's workload is taken into consideration when money is allocated. It was kind of a shock for some courts to have to deal with that, because some courts' workload did not justify the amount of money that they were previously getting. That kind of a concern is trans, uh, transferred really over to your role as administrative presiding judge of the 4th District, is that correct? That's right. As uh, PJ, administrative PJ of the 4th District, one of my tasks is to uh, equalize the workload uh, among the judges. And in our court, the 4th Appellate District, we have three divisions one in San Diego with 10 justices, one in Riverside uh, with seven, although it will soon be eight justices, and one in Santa Ana with eight justices. And uh, since I became, when I started here, our court here in San Diego was doing a lot of cases from our Santa Ana division because they got way backed up. Uh, now we're doing a lot of cases from our River, Riverside division because they have such a heavy criminal caseload. So all of the justices here, sitting here in San Diego, are doing uh, uh, cases from uh, Division Two Riverside. How has that been received by the, the, the bar? The bar is happy to get their cases resolved. Uh, the, uh, uh, we, for a while we were doing big civil cases as well, and the civil bar was very happy to get the cases resolved. But I just decided to do only criminal cases so that the civil litigants weren't burdened with the cost of having to have their lawyers come down to San Diego. Uh, and because the criminal bar is headquartered here in San Diego, so it's not really a burden on them to come here. The fourth district has uh, a caseload second only to the second, is that That's correct? That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And the second uh, has the heaviest caseload 
Uh, and of course, it's a big court, 32 judges, and uh, ours is now 26 judges. As administrative presiding judge, you meet on a regular basis with uh, uh, the uh, presiding judges of the other dis uh, appellate court districts and the chief judge. Is that correct? I, I, I meet regularly with the administrative presiding justices of the six di districts, meet with the chief justice about quarterly, and we meet with the Judicial Council staff and we go over issues like budget and uh, legislation and issues of importance to the courts. And then here uh, in the fourth district, I meet regularly with the two other presiding justices and their management staff. Uh, one of the things that I've worked very hard is to make the uh, rules of court more uniform throughout the district because it's the same criminal bar that handles every uh, one of our courts. And, uh, and, I, and I, to some, we have had a measure of success in that regard. Uh, we went to electronic filing at more or less the same time with the same procedures uh, implementing electronic filing so that the other presiding justices have been very good to work with to uh, improve the consistency of rules and practices. There's one big uh, practice that's different in our di second division and uh, that is in Riverside they have the tentative opinions go out uh, before uh, oral argument is scheduled. We don't do that here in Division One, nor do they do it in Division Three. But other than that, we have very uh, consistent rules and procedures. What do you see as some of the most vexing problems facing appellate courts today? Well, it's always a problem allocating uh, resources. Uh, that this is facing the presiding justices because when the population shifts, the resources don't always shift with the population. So that's one of the reasons we transfer cases, quite frankly. Recently we transferred a huge case from our court up to the fifth uh, district because it was uh, more than our court could handle, frankly, with the heavy caseloads that we have. Uh, all of the courts cooperate with each other, which is the, uh, we're blessed in that regard. Uh, so I think it's in making sure that the resources are adequate f when the population changes or the workload changes. And, and that's, uh, I'm not sure we're still there, we're there yet, but it's, it's something we're working on. If you could look into a crystal ball what do you see the issues being for the California courts as we go the next 50 years? Well, I think it's very important that the public understand the role of the courts and that, and they don't really. I mean, I think people, if, if people will tell you when they're summoned for jury duty, they, they hate it. They say, oh, I've got a jury summons, I've got to go to jury duty. And I think they, you know, that's partly why we changed the whole jury selection process, the one day one trial, was to make it less burdensome. People who have served on juries respect the court and respect the process, they, they actually do. But, but, but people don't like the courts. Courts are anti-majoritarian, they make decisions that may not be popular. And, uh, and I think we need to do a better job of educating the public about what the job of courts is. And when I say the public, I don't just mean the ordinary voters, but I mean our, our leaders in Sacramento and Washington need to have a better understanding of the important role that courts serve in our democracy. And when we, if we lose that, we're going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, that's one of the reasons I'm working on the Chief Civic Learning Initiative. I'm very worried about the future of the judicial branch. Tell us about what you're doing on the uh, Chief's um, uh, civil, civic learning process. Well, I, I started working on this uh, with, as a result of the Commission for Impartial Courts. Uh, I chaired the Public Information and Education uh, Task Force of that commission. And one of our recommendations was uh, we found that civic education was not good 
that uh, people were uh, uh, going out as adults, uh, having gone through the educational system, not being informed as voters, not understanding how important it was to vote, not understanding the role of the three branches. They didn't understand democracy. They often don't appreciate democracy. So the, uh, our recommendation was that the judicial branch take a leadership role in improving civic education in California. So the Judicial Council adopted that recommendation. They set up a leadership group on civic education, but there was no money. It was a bad budget time and there was no money. So, uh, uh, but then our Chief Justice came into office in 2011 and she had two uh, girls in, in public school and she wanted to do something on civic education. And here I was head of this leadership group. So she asked me to do a summit on civic education and we did. We got Sandra Day O'Connor here. Uh, she appointed some really good people to work with me. Frank Damarello, who was a district court judge at the time, uh, and others, educators, professional educators. And we started working on a summit. And we developed also the Civic Learning Award to reward those schools that were doing a good job of educating their students. And we work with the Department of Education. Oh, at our summit, I mentioned Sandra Day O'Connor spoke, but the chief entered into an agreement with the state superintendent to establish a, a California task force on K-12 civic learning to study what the needs were. And we came out with a report in 2014 that we are now working on implementing. And we have made huge improvements. We have now, the you know, civics wasn't really taught much in California. The government. And if they taught civics, which they did do, seniors usually had to have a semester of civics, the second semester, where they've already lost interest in, you know, in their high school education. They're already moving on. And the books talked only about bad decisions, uh, the, the government books that they were using. We have changed that in California. We have now the Department of Education, the State Board of Education has adopted a new framework for history social sciences that includes civics for the first time. Civic learning is a priority. We also got it into English language arts uh, standards so that they can teach, you know, you can teach civics. Have them read the Constitution. You're teaching them how to read sophisticated documents. Make them read the Constitution. Uh, make them read some of our founding documents. Uh, they'll learn a lot about our government if they do that. Uh, we even think you can do it in science and math, uh, but that's going to be a little harder challenge. But for sure, we needed to have civics taught as part of history, social sciences, and it needs to start in kindergarten and go all the way through. Have there been those that have said to you, you're judges, you don't need to be doing education? Uh, no, actually, <laughs> no. The, I think uh, it's part of our job to educate the public. We need to educate the public about the judiciary. We need to educate them about the decision-making process and the fact in the Court of Appeal, all of our decisions are in writing. If they want to know what our decisions are, they can look them up pretty easily. I felt as a trial judge that it was very important that the media know what I was deciding and why, so I often did written decisions and had a stack of them available for reporters on uh, controversial cases. Uh, I think the judges have a big role in explaining what they do and why they do it. And the more we do that, uh, the better support we'll get from, from the public that we serve. You talked a bit about facilitating public understanding of uh, the judicial's de judiciary's decisions by working with the press. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, you know, I, I'm, the, I'm the daughter of a newspaper man. I grew up, my first job was as a, the first female copy boy at the Pasadena Star News. And uh, I have it in my veins. Uh, and my dad uh, always told me that, now, if the press calls, take their call. We can't talk to the press, of course, about our cases or our decisions, but we can talk to them about our process. 
And uh, at one point, uh, a few years ago, I actually put on a program here in San Diego for all of the press, TV and print. And uh, uh, we brought Carol Corrigan down to talk about the Supreme Court. We talked about the Court of Appeal. We had somebody talk about the Superior Court. I talked about the Commission on Judicial Performance. It was an educational program to educate them about the branch. And that we gave them free lunch. And I thought that was really a good thing for the court to do, to provide education to the people who were sending out the news. Now the news has changed so dramatically. It's not just, you know, the LA Times or the New York Times or the Washington Post. It's all these blogs or it's social media. And so uh, educating the public requires us to use social media. And the Judicial Council is doing that. And in fact, our uh, uh, Power of Democracy, which is our Civic Learning Steering Committee, is has a Twitter account, a Facebook account. I don't do Facebook, but a lot of people do. And so it's important that the, uh, the that we use all of the modern tools that are available to educate the public about what we're doing and why we're doing, making the decisions we make. You talked about um, telling the press about the Commission on Judicial Performance. You served on the Commission on Judicial Performance from 2005 through 2012 and was the chair of the commission. What is that commission and why is it important to the judiciary and to California? So I, um, I originally was, the, mem the judicial members of the Commission on Judicial Performance are elected by the Supreme Court. and. I uh, had, I can't remember what the committee was. It was some committee having to do with ethics issues. Ethics issues for presiding ju judges. And so uh, one of our local PJs, San Diego, was chair of that. And I was vice chair. I think I was already on the Court of Appeal at the time. And, and we met with the Commission on Judicial Performance to tell them what our complaints were, our grievances. I must say that when I finished that meeting, I was soaking wet. I was so nervous about meeting with the Commission on Judicial Performance. And then, uh, uh, then I got a call from uh, the chief's uh, principal attorney asking me if I would be willing to take on a, an appointment to or election to the commission. And I said, I need to think about it. <laughs> Uh, so I called Vance Ray, who's the presiding justice of the third district. He said, oh, he said, it's a lot of reading, uh, but you won't have a problem doing it in short order. Well, so I accepted the appointment, and there are only three, three out of the 11 members of the commission are judges, uh, two trial and one appellate, and it is a huge amount of work. The public members do look to the judicial members for guidance on how calendars are handled. And so the judicial members have an especially important role on the CJP. Uh, while we were, while I was, I was chaired it for three years, uh, we made some changes in the process. One of the changes was spearheaded by uh, uh, Fred Horn, who uh, got the Chief Justice and Chief Justice uh, Ron George to establish the California Judicial Ethics Advisory Committee to issue formal written opinions and that committee is now up and running and doing a fantastic job. And my big accomplishment was to get the decisions of the CJP published in the official reports. Uh, because until then they were uh, on the CJP website or they were written up in the newspaper, but it was not any formal publication. And the Chief Justice agreed to that. And uh, so now all of the opinions uh, in formal proceedings uh, are of the CJP are published in the official uh, records. But being on the CJP was a huge amount of work. I figured I mean, they have like seven meetings a, uh, uh, a year and uh, about 40 hours of reading, it seems, for every meeting. Oh, I'm exaggerating, but it was a lot of work. And I felt I had to read every page 
because I was the only appellate judge on the commission and I couldn't recommend or vote on something if I didn't know exactly what it was all about. And the judge's career uh, rests in that. The CJP is important, not just to, uh, it's important to the judges because it, it gives the public assurance that there's a mechanism for uh, uh, reviewing behavior that may or may not be unethical. So for judges who are in family court, for example, often they deal with very troubled uh, people and so family court people complain and the commission has an opportunity to look and see, yes, there was a problem or no, there wasn't. And I, I often felt the big shame that they don't have court reporters anymore uh, in all family law proceedings. But actually the biggest source of complaints on the commission was from criminal uh, uh, defendants people who had been convicted of crimes and were in prison, they have a lot of time on their hands. And so they file a lot of complaints uh, with the commission and some of them were well-founded. But the commission had a very important role and we did a lot of education. As commission members, we uh, spoke at all kinds of uh, uh, judicial educational programs at the state bar to let the bar know what their role was because there are two uh, state bar members who are members of the commission as well. And um, I think it's one of the best institutions in the country. I've, I'm familiar with how some of the other judicial disciplinary bodies operate, and ours uh, is uh, the top and is the model for other states. You um, have been described and someone looks back over your your career both as a lawyer and as a judge and someone has said that you improved the treatment of women under the law and in the law that you were a relentless advocate for the rights of women champion for gender equality and diversity in the judiciary that you were a distinguished judicial leader who was dedicated to achieving fairness and recognition for women attorneys, jurists, victims, and staff in the judicial system, and that you're an ardent supporter of an independent judiciary. Of all the things that you have done, what are you most proud of? Well, I think we have a better court today uh, now that we are a more diverse court. Uh, uh, for one thing, judges aren't working in a vacuum. They work with their colleagues. They learn from their colleagues. If you have people with diverse backgrounds on the bench, they're going to learn from each other. Uh, the appellate court especially so, uh, because all of our decisions are group decisions. That was a big shock to me when I went on the Court of Appeal, having been on the trial court for so many years where you just make all the decisions and then you leave it up, the Court of Appeal straightens out whatever mess you make. Uh, I, I thought, uh, I think we are a much better court today than we were when I started. I thought the judges that I appeared in front of were terrific, but I will tell you, they were all white males. And uh, Earl Gilliam was a judge. I never had the opportunity to appear in front of him, but uh, he was African American. But that was the exception. There were very few, and he was treated terribly uh, by his bench. So I think we've made some big improvements uh, in the courts. I just, I regret that there is still such a lack of understanding of the importance of a fair and impartial judiciary uh, in our legislat legislatures in general and in our other civic leaders. I think they really need to understand what a treasure a fair and impartial judicial branch is because if we don't have that we're going to end up uh, like some of these dictators that we see in other countries. Justice McConnell, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you doing this, Joan.